Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, owner of Birds Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I am honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers and readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. So if you missed last week's episode with Gail Mazur, Lloyd Schwartz, and Nicole Therese Dutton, or any of the previous episodes of Write America, you can go to Birds Books Crowdcast channel and watch the recordings at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you missed something, you can go back and rewatch. Tonight, Birds Books hosts readings by and conversation with Rachel Paston, Allison Fairbrother, and Taim Bajess. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, I think many of you discover the chat to the right of your screen. Please feel free to comment all throughout the evening. But if you have a question, I'm going to look at the bottom of your screen. There is an ask a question tab, and that's where I'd like you to type your questions. At the bottom of the screen also is a green link to this episode on Bird's Books website, where you can purchase the author's books while supporting the bookstore in Write America. Our first speaker is Rachel Paston. Rachel Paston is the author of four novels, most recently In the Field, based on the life of Nobel Prize winning geneticist Barbara McClintock. In her 2014 novel, Elena, an, update, an updating of Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca set in the contemporary art world, was named an editor's choice in the New York Times Book Review. When not writing fiction, she has worked as an editor at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia and, it's, and at a small town newspaper. Please welcome to the screen, Rachel Paston. Let me find you, Rachel. There you are. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, for um, that lovely introduction. And it's such an honor to be reading as part of this program and to be reading with Allison and Taimba. Um, I, and, and it's certainly a, it's quite a week to be reading in a series that's about trying to figure out how to heal the country and move us forward. Um, I'm going to read to you tonight from my, from my newest novel um, about that's based on the life of Barbara McClintock, as Alice said, uh, in the field. And what I tried to do in this book was really to inhabit uh, and examine what it took for a woman in the early part of the 20th century to do the work in science that she was really driven to do. Um, and I'm gonna read you um, obviously just a few short sections. I'm going to start with the prologue, which takes place in 1982, and then I'm going to read from chapter one, which goes back to uh, the 1930s. Prologue. In summer at that hour, she would have been out in the cornfield already. Hot green smell of rising stalks, sharp blades of dew damp leaves wasps buzzing. But it was October now and dark. Kate had always been a light sleeper, an early riser, eager for what the day might bring. Often wakeful and restless, she wandered down to the lab in the heavy stillness of 3 a.m. She kept a cot there among the shelves of microscope slides and back issues of genetics in case she got sleepy and didn't want to bother coming back upstairs. After an hour's doze, she'd wake with her mind clear as though scrubbed, the work waiting. This morning though, 5.20 by the stove clock, 
She was upstairs in the apartment kitchen when the phone rang. Drinking coffee in her old seersucker robe, her round steel glasses polished with a carefully pressed handkerchief, she was absorbed in an article about yeast. Some days lately, her mind felt sticky, a swollen door she had to tug open, but today it was working fine. When the phone rang, a loud, bright trill intruding on the humming silence, she glanced at it darkly. What kind of person called at the crack of dawn? Two parallel answers, like two parallel streams of bubbles in an aquarium, bloomed in her gut and rose. But if someone had died, who could it be? Nearly everyone she ever loved was dead already. As for the other, well, it was October. She lifted the heavy cold receiver to her ear. Hello? Is this Dr. Kathleen Croft, a male voice said, melodic, affable, vaguely foreign. I have some very good news. The words clogged and confused her brain. They were like lights stuttering in the darkness and then going out. Then he told her what he'd called to tell her, her work, an award, recognition long overdue. Afterwards, she couldn't remember what he'd said exactly. The old ghostly voices swirled around her as if trying to drown him out. Her mother's, it's a waste of money to send a girl to college. Dr. Krause's, young women don't take this work seriously. Hiram Cole's, science is not something to pass the time with until you get married. Well, that was true enough. But nowhere in the citation was the significance of her discovery mentioned, the true significance that she, leaping from sight to insight, had understood long ago, that genes did not absolutely determine what an organism would be. It was as though you celebrated Thomas Edison for making a filament of carbon incandescent without explaining what the thing did, light up a dark room. So now I'm gonna skip ahead, which is skipping backwards in time to 1923, when Kate is just 18 years old, going off to college. Kate had signed up for introduction to biology back in September because her housemate, Thea, was taking it, and she wanted Kate to take it too. Otherwise, I'll be the only one, she said. Thea was taller than Kate, pale and gray-eyed in her plaid pleated jumpers. A long braid hung down her back, bouncing and swaying when she walked the strands almost blonde where the light caught them. The only what, Kate asked. Girl, Thea said. Those classes have a hundred people in them, Kate said, but she signed up anyway, and it turned out Thea was right. They were the only two. They were freshmen, and it was 1923. Kate and Thea lay squashed together on Kate's bed on top of the dusty coverlet, waiting for the moon to rise. The night before, Kate had seen it glowing right in the middle of the window, bright as a pearl, and she wanted to show it to Thea. They had turned out the lights so they would be more dazzled when it came. In the meantime, they quizzed each other for their upcoming test, taking turns in the dark. What are the principal parts of a flower, Kate asked. The hue of the sky seemed to shift as she looked, crow black to charcoal to iron gray. There was always so much more to everything if you looked closely. That was the main thing college was teaching her, a thousand shades and subtleties to what had seemed the simplest truth. Pistol, Thea said, stamen. Those are the female and the male parts. Also, you've got, let's see, petal and sepal. 
Now it was her turn to ask something. About the pistol, she said, name the part that's sticky and sweet, the part that ripens into a fruit. Beside her, Kate could feel Thea breathing. If she were a plant, she would be fed by Thea's CO2. Name one common vector for cross-fertilization. Bees, Thea said dreamily. Aren't bees amazing? I mean, they make honey with their own bodies. They communicate by dancing. Yes, Kate agreed. Bees are wonderful, much to be wondered at. God was inspired when he thought of bees, Thea said. Do you really believe there's a God, Kate said? Of course. In the dark, Thea sounded shocked. It was warm in the small room, late September, but the weather was still fine. People said Ithaca would soon be buried under drifts of snow, but Kate and Thea had agreed they'd believe it when they saw it. Now, Kate said earnestly, everything is a question. Surely they agreed about that. Thea squirmed, not everything. Some things are answers to the questions. Kate grasped Thea's elbow as though her friend might slip away if she didn't hold on to her. Listen, she said, God is too easy an answer. Why is the sky blue? Why are there mountains here and gorges there? A person could spend a lifetime trying to answer those questions. But if you just say, it's like that because of God, you haven't said anything at all. Thea's springy hair tumbled as she shook her head loose strands tickling Kate's face. You're talking about one kind of question, but I'm talking about something else, something deeper. What do you mean deeper? Kate felt excited and agitated as though something were on the verge of being revealed. She could feel Thea's pulse beating under her skin beside her. I mean, behind all that, under it, underneath everything, you mean like the floor, Kate asked? No, underneath everything. Like the cellar? Like the foundation of the house? Like the ground? She thought about the Earth's thin, rocky crust, which she was learning about in geology. And under that, the dense and smoldering core, so hot that metals turned to liquid and seethed in the darkness. She was not prepared to reopen the question of God but there was something, something hidden. It had to do with the way the disparate parts were connected maybe. The color of the sky and the location of the mountains and the texture of Thea's hair. Sometimes if she stood very still, if she kept her mind very still, like a grain of sand, she could feel it thrumming like overtones on the piano or like blood in the veins or like the sound a falling star made in the vacuum of space. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Our next speaker is Alison Fairbrother. Alison Fairbrother's novel, The Catch, was released last Tuesday from Random House. She is an associate editor at Riverhead Books, and she received her MFA from Stony Brook University. Please welcome to the screen, Alison Fairbrother. There we go. Hi. Thank you, Alice. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Um, it's such an honor to be part of this Write America program and um, an honor to be here with Rachel and Taimba reading. Um, I'm going to read a little few pages from the beginning of my debut novel, The Catch, chapter one. My father, a minor poet, celebrated holidays out of season. He couldn't get custody of all four of his children at once, so he moved the fall, spring, and winter holidays to the heat of summer. A man who had fathered four kids with three different women was unusual in our Maryland town. Neighbors gossiped and strangers commented. My father struggled financially, and I suppose he could have resented the way we tethered him, but he didn't. 
Over and over, he brought us into his world. The first holiday I remember was summer Christmas. I was seven, shy and compliant. Our neighbors swam in the Chesapeake and grilled hot dogs. We sat inside and heaped a fake fir tree with tinsel and chains of cranberries. We knew Christmas in summer was odd, but we didn't care. In fact, we liked it, or at least I did. Getting to celebrate with my father in the wrong season was far superior to not celebrating with him at all. He was the kind of parent you wanted to be with, and on a holiday, he took such pleasure. Once he lifted one of my baby half sisters up to press a snowman cookie cutter into a roll of dough. And in that moment, when her shirt rose and her arms stretched out and everyone was oven hot and overexcited, I thought that if I ever had children, I would scramble up the holidays too, not because I would need to, but just because I could. Dad's second wife, Barbara, the woman he married after he divorced my mother, would go upstairs after dinner to give my two half sisters a bath and put them to bed. She was like the head nun at a nunnery, a grim tactician, her hair always in a bun, and she absented herself from me as much as possible. Because I was the oldest and she wasn't my mother, and because my real mother was then far away in Philadelphia, I was allowed to stay up late with dad. I sat by his knee and listened to him strum his guitar and sing Jimmy Crack Corn, which I later learned was racist. Easter came in summer too, in July. Dad bought dye kits from Walmart and we dropped colored tablets into plastic cups, adding vinegar and watching the dye swirl through the water. He was so enthusiastic about the whole thing as if he were a scientist trying to get his children interested in his chosen field. There were a few happy years of Easter egg hunts, our cheeks fat with chocolate, Barbara wiping my sister's mouths with wet napkins, until the year of dad and Barbara's divorce, when he lost patience with the flimsy egg holder and dunked his egg directly in the cup, staining his fingers iridescent purple. My half-sisters, then four and three, paced our father's new place, sniffling and listing all the things they missed about their mom's house, the stuffed animals that hadn't made the half hour trip and a favorite bedtime book called Randy the Hippopotamus. I didn't miss Barbara at all. I thought of her alone in the bathroom I would never see again, removing pins from her bun, drawing herself a bath and letting the water out at 7.45 p.m. exactly. Dad and I let my sisters splash in his new tub as long as they wanted until their skin was mushroomy and they'd finished soaping all their Easter rabbit figurines. After they were tucked in bed, exhausted and pink, their eyelids fluttering because of chocolate or dreams, Dad put his fingers on my shoulder and said, you bring out the best in me, Ellie. The first time I met Colette, who would become wife number three, was the following year at Summer New Year's. We all wore oversized blue glitter sunglasses and we painted signs that read, So Long 1999. Dad made raspberry fring frongs, juice and ginger ale with a raspberry floating on top. I am certain he named them. The grown ups, the grown -ups fring frongs were topped with gin. If Colette was nonplussed that we were ringing in the millennium four months earlier than everyone else, she hid it well. When you were married to my father or when you were one of his children, you got with the program because that was what everyone else did. And the program was always exciting, so you never really minded. Colette though, did she mind? She must have known what he was like. The word boyish was frequently in play. And it was an appealing description because how many women had married older, divorced men only to find themselves soon taking care of them in ways they had never anticipated. But a boyish man, a perpetual boy, would last a long time. He could grow older with the beautiful, girlish woman he loved, and together they would have a family, and together they would have a life. Colette, did she think about any of this?
I remember she spread newspapers on the kitchen table and made popsicle stick picture frames with my half sisters, the family she had inherited. She asked with genuine interest whether I had a crush on anyone at school and I told her about Ronnie Devine. I tried to hate her for encroaching on my territory as dad's closest confidant, but mostly I didn't take her seriously. She had slim Irish looks and dark wavy hair. She knew which plants to mash into pastes and boil into tea, but she didn't read books and she never knew where her keys were. She was like a medieval village herbalist. I didn't think she would be around long. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Taimba Jess who is the author of two books of poetry, Lead Belly and Olio. Olio won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize, the Anisfeld Book Wolf Book Award, the Midland Society Authors Award in Poetry, and received an outstanding contribution to publishing citation from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. It was also nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Lead Belly was the winner of the, 20, of the 2004 National Poetry Series. The Library, excuse me, Journal and Black Issues Book Review both named it one of the best poetry books of 2005. Jess, a Kawe Kanem and NYU alum, received the 20, 2004 Literature Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts and was a 2004-2005 Winter Fellow at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center. He presented his poetry at the 2011 TEDx Nashville Conference and won a 2016 Lannan Literary Award in Poetry. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2018. Jess is a professor of English at College of Staten Island. Please welcome to the screen Taimba Jess. Let me find you here. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Am I? Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you. Me? Great. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Great. Well, hey, great to be here. Uh, that was uh, really enchanting listening to Rachel and Allison. So uh, thank you for bringing me their, them to my attention. Um, it's great to be here. So I'm going to read a little bit, some excerpts from Olio. Uh, this book is about 19th century African-American um, creatives. And uh, one in particular that is featured in a certain way in the book is Scott Joplin, who is the father of ragtime. And in this excerpt from the book, it's uh, I'm going to excerpt from an interview uh, between a gentleman who is in search of the legacy of Scott Joplin and uh, a nurse who tended to Scott Joplin towards the end of, a day, of his days. He died of syphilis on April Fool's Day in 1917. <clears throat> so, what were your duties with Mr. Joplin? bathing, feeding, tending bed sores. Wasn't much to be done by that point, but dose him up and let him move on from this world. He didn't say much, move very little, except when I would hold him up for back bathing. He would try to play his scales on the bedside table. I would be wiping them down while he played rags on that invisible piano, all slow motion and stiff, all herky-jerky like a rusted up gadget. So far gone into his dreams, he didn't know much of whoever came to visit, but knew how to find that middle C, knew how to grow something in his head nobody else could hear. Of course, that might have been sickness talking, but there he was with music stuck all up in his hands, him trying to work it all out before he left. How did he play? Like I said, he didn't play much except when he was all feeble fingered twitching on the air or on the table or on the wall or on his stretched, stretched out legs. But one last time he played the real piano in the great room. I think it had been months since he touched the key. Really wasn't supposed to have him down there as he was 
terminal and care and all. But did it matter? That's what I thought anyway. Man about to be passed, man about to pass on over. He might as well have one last play. Wheeled him down there a few days before he passed. Let him sit in a wheelchair stacked up on pillows. Didn't do nothing for such a long time. Nothing but stare at the keys, his eyes all empty like broken pails. But then he moved a little. It was like watching raw sap coming out of a tree. He was moving so slow, and when he hit the first note, it barely made a sound. By the end, he wasn't nothing but a tremble. What did he play? Well, now I must confess that I don't know all of those songs. Most I know is how he played, what it was sounding like. So first he played pretty good, you know, like the, like the kind of good you want to tell somebody about just right before you doze off. The kind of notes that come strong at first and then fade to the next till you wonder where you began and they ended at. And other times, you make me want to just look away, look up from the keys and through, through me, through the brick and mortar ward, through Manhattan, like he was looking out a window, wondering whether to jump, half blind one second, sway headed like a newborn the next. And then he played like that. It was, when he played like that, it was, well, old timey one minute, then lovely terrible. Like he had another life in the music, but he couldn't get it all the way out to save him in this one. Or like he was playing another language on the keys, begging us to hear it with him. And then sometimes playing all slow, like he wanted us to learn every note. Then other times he'd be frantic, digging through them black and whites, like he was looking for something he lost, or was left of himself. Was it ragtime? Yes, sir. It was ragtime, all right. <laughs> and then it was just plain raggedy, all stitched together, loose in some parts and painful tight in others. Heard a cakewalk in there, but then the walk started to lean too hard and got drunk off its own sway. Heard some spirituals, near my God to thee, done toiling here, but they wore too much pride to be prayerful. Heard a hint of that new blue music, but he let the keys sing too free to be truly sorrowful. It was a true mix up, boy, I'm telling you. Didn't know rightly how to feel after he stopped. Wasn't no way to know whether a man should just take his hat off his head or throw it up in the air, whether a woman should put her hands together over and over or just hold them up to her mouth with a silent prayer. So we all just sat there and watched, silent, the sick, the dying, the nurses. We watched them crawl all over that keyboard like a beggar in the gutter and a king on the sauce. Watched him leave half his life sped across the keys till he left himself half dead. That ragtime. Maybe he knew something we didn't know. I could have swore when he was playing the last the last tune in the great room, he was just glowing with something that I ain't never seen before. Almost like he was listening to it and smiling deep inside himself. How did he play? How long did he play? What's time got to do with it? Long enough, son. Long enough. And that's an excerpt from a uh, little interview with uh, a guy who's in search of the, uh, <clears throat> the story of Scott Joplin. And I think I'll read. Uh, I think I'll read one more or so from this uh, from this book. And this one is about Sissy Reddy Jones. Sissy Reddy Jones was a really interesting person. She was an opera singer. She's the first black person to sing in Carnegie Hall, really before it was even called Carnegie Hall in 1892 and uh she went on to become a really very famous op you know opera singer although she uh was never allowed a real a role in a formal opera so to speak so really her her stage was always shared with uh with a crew of a kind of a minstrel show called the black patty 
troubadours. So now Sissy Retta Jones, she was named Black Patty because there was another white opera singer named Adelina Patty. So she was called Black Patty, but her, her actual name was Sissy Retta Jones. So this is Sissy Retta Jones and the Black Patty Troubadours. Forte, Garazioso. Forte, with force was the will that overtook me, that freed my throat and lit my mouth to music. Forte was each wave of song. Forte, like my father's choir of freedmen, sometimes wavered in off key, sometimes pitched in more fear than light, but always Forte hurling what voice was left to them in the, into the cauldron of church air after lifetime singing their spirituals in secret. They sang forte like the Steve Doors shout from ship to shore, crate after crate of cargo burdened into the holds, their gandy opera bouncing off holes, forte in the grazioso of their motion, the altogether swing of arm and hand and rope and hoisted weight Grazioso on the decks, all braced for storm, all blessed with prayer from each providence pulpit. Prayer prayed over from bow to stern, blessings from the communion cry of each church, all grazioso with hands raised in testimony. I hear them each night, forte, when I stand on our prow of stage from town to town, port to port, captain of this ragtag ship of black-faced cakewalking fools and balladeers, teaching crowds grazioso under spotlights with each ticket sold. Forte is the cry of the barker, bundling each crowd with the smooth talk promise, darky entertainment with a touch of high-class classical. Forte is the finale each night. Grazioso is the closing curtain, the unmasking of painted faces, the darkened lamplight, the applause fading like the hush of receding surf that carries us on through the night. The ocean of audience rising and falling with each wave of season. Grazioso is the sail of our bodies in their wind. Thank you. That was a that was a very powerful reading. Thank you. Um, so, I, I mean, so I'm in, I'm so interested, Taimba, in the way that you are. I mean, you and I are kind of in the same territory with writing people, um, versions of people, people whose lives are um, at odds with the world in some way. And I guess I'm thinking today about this bigger question of how politics works in literature and fiction or in poetry. And I wonder how you think about that when you're, are you just like writing the people, writing their lives? Are you thinking about the broader questions? And really for both of you, but starting with you guys, with you because of, because of that, the quality of that work. You know, I think, I mean, I, 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 I was appreciating what you were, uh, the, the relationships you were making between uh, a kind of um, constriction of one's intellectual capacity, you know, and one's full expression of self. Uh, and and I, I can see that, I can see the historical parallels in terms of, of restrictions upon, yeah. you know, not just the intellect, but the body and what, and what, you know what kind of capacity one is uh, allowed to or permitted to uh, exercise. You know, so I think that in, 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 that's one thing that I was definitely thinking about in in uh, in terms of your the uh, the speaker's pursuit of science and and pursuit of uh, of self, so to speak. And I think, and but I think that the same things. It's 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 kind of hard to not to think of the present and when you're thinking about these past they force they force themselves into your consciousness and so you start building parallels and i don't know if about you but one thing i start thinking about is if i'm writing this for 
80, 100, 120 years ago, how does it speak to somebody today? Yeah. How do they, what is the, what is the bridge? How do they connect? How do you, how do you make that connection? Cause it can be, you know, we, you, after a lot of research, we can get into it. We can see it, but the challenge is how to make other people understand and, and see that. But I think that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. And, and I've heard, um, I, you know, I've been asked about, um, how I keep like the present out of the stuff I'm writing about the past. And I guess the way I feel about that is if they bleed into each other, A, maybe it's inevitable and B, maybe as you're saying, like that's kind of, maybe that's the point. You know, we don't want to keep them separated because we're writing about all this stuff. We're writing about the past, we're writing about the present um, and mm -hmm. all of the connections between them. Yeah, I would agree. I would say one thing that I, I I have sometimes had to do is to limit my engagement <laughs> with the present to a certain degree, because so I can get really caught up. You yeah. Know? I mean, I can get go down rabbit holes, and next thing you know, I'm writing something other than the thing that I should be writing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where I'm yeah. doing a lot, a lot of research on something not pertinent to the project that I at hand. So that. You know, I, but I guess that's true with all of us. But. Yeah, how do you know? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I had a question for both of you. Each of you, it seems, are writing about really extraordinary, sort of pioneering, creative people. And I wonder, in each of your cases, um, did it expand your own creative strategies or your attachment to the process or did it open up new possibilities for you in your own creative lives i i guess i would say for me um i i wish that i could say that it did but i don't but i don't think that it did i i think for me this novel was a different kind of novel than i had written before um, it takes place over a longer span of time, and it has a sort of less conventional narrative. But I don't think that had to do with thinking about the character who I was writing about. Although it was really cool to be able to inhabit her for a couple of years and to feel just the pleasure of trying to be inside the mind of someone whose mind felt so expansive to me. Um, and maybe there's some version of that, like with every, you know, with any character we choose to write, right? So, I mean, Allison, for you, when you're thinking about a character that you're writing, how much do you think about the head that you're going to be in for whatever period of time that is and how you might interact with it? Yeah, I wrote this novel in first person, which I felt gave me such a unique kind of authority to inhabit the head of the person I was writing about. And I found that that was a really necessary shit, a necessary tense, I guess, for me. Um, it, it allowed me to sort of drop in in this way. But I have to say, it took many months or even years, I think, to get the tone of vo and the voice right so that it felt really authentic. But once I was in that character, um, everything became, everything shifted and, and sort of became alive for me. Mm -hmm. Tamba, how about for you, did it, did writing about these characters when you're writing about Scott Joplin, were you writing in a different mode? Was your mind opened in a different way? Well, I think that, you know, one thing that uh, struck me was the uh, ingenuity of the people that I was writing about. And they were, uh, under very difficult circumstances, trying to create, you know, follow the, the human impulse of, of creation or, and, and creativity. And I think that, you know, the fact that they were dealing with lots of constraints made me think about constraints for the writing that I was involved in and, and create constraints that, that, that created in turn more possibilities. So, you know, I, I was really, you know, I, I was really very struck by, and I was also, um, you know, a little upset that I hadn't heard about these people before. So, so that kind of added to the, uh, added to the, uh, the, 
me manage to create something that would catch the audience's eye and keep me involved and interested as well, you know. What kind of constraints did you put on yourself? Well, I wrote in form a lot. I wrote in sonnets and, and some of the sonnets speak to each other. So one sonnet will be on one side and the other one will be on the other side. And you can read lot, you can read them down and you can also read these sonnets across. So and so you can read down across diagonally and then up. So there were a lot of constraints that I was putting upon myself. And some were some were geometric uh, constraints. They had to do with, uh, you know, Euclidean geometry and and uh, things of that nature, and, and paper construction, things things like that. And then there's always really <clears throat> the real constraint is um, how do you keep yourself engaged, and how do you keep yourself. Uh, motivated and interested in these things and these in these issues you know I mean, ever, you ever think like while you're writing about somebody who's been dead x amount of years like how do i how do i come up with something new how do, I mean, how do i keep the reader and myself engaged in this in this scenario and how do i how do i how do i make it fresh for myself you know and i think that's a lot a lot of what i would say i think I feel like for me, the, um, the the real person was so fascinating that I felt um, I felt like like that was a great comfort to me to always be able to fall back on. And right now, I'm 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 starting to write something new after not having written for maybe three years, and it's crazy. It's like you could do anything. So how could you decide what to do? And you know that sense that. Once the decision is made, then the decision is made, and I will be living with that decision for years. So maybe that doesn't apply so much to poetry as it does to novel writing, right, Allison? So, like, so I don't know if you started to work on something new yet, um, and and you know, it's like a tunnel narrowing down, right? Like at every stage. It really is. Yeah. I worked on my novel for six years and it took such an, an immense amount of concentration. Um, I'm sort of relishing not working on anything right now, <laughs> just going out into the sunshine and trying to find joy where I can, you know, in the midst of everything that's going on in our country. Um, but yeah, I think the I'm excited for that stage that you're at, Rachel, where there's the possibility of something new. You know, I'm not quite there. My editor keeps asking me what I'm working on now. And I keep saying, oh yeah, I'm working, I'm working. But really, you know, I'm drinking rosé on a roof with my friends. And I think that's important as well, you know. But Rachel, I wanted to ask you because I'm, in my day job, I'm a book editor. I, I work on novels. And I think it's actually quite rare for me to see a novel about a woman at work. Mm -hmm. um, I see so many novels about love and romance and family, and and I think it's very hard to write about a woman at work. And I wonder what your experience was and how you came to that. Yeah, that was definitely one of the things that I wanted to make sure I didn't lose when working on this book, which also took me maybe not quite six years, but maybe to write, was um, I really wanted it to be about the work and I really wanted it I really wanted to get into the science and and bring the science out in a way that was both true to it and also engaging um, to people who weren't ne wouldn't necessarily be interested in science per se. Um, so ha so how to use metaphor to do that? How to get inside the characters, both her head and her emotions? Like what does it feel like to be doing that work? Um, she's a difficult person. Um, and I think also writing about difficult women is a is an important thing to do. Something that I really am drawn to doing, um, letting her letting her be both um, brilliant and sympathetic, and getting in her own way and pissing people off, and all and all of those things. Because um, you have to do. I, I think especially for a character who got as much done as as this character will get done. 
you need so many forces, so many complicated and contradictory forces driving you. Um, and and I, I I love books about work, whether it's men men at work or women at work. It's such a wonderful. I always tell my students, if you have work that's that you know about, right? How bring it to the page because it generally is so interesting to read about. And that's true. Thinking about too with Tambo with the um, with reading about with, with you writing about the the piano and playing it and the rags and the ragginess and you know just the the texture of that actual um, making of that music is part of what's so wonderful in that in that poem. Well, you know, I have you know, I think one interesting thing is it's every project or every book has things that the author wished they'd have been able to put in the book, but mm -hmm. weren't able to quite fit in, or that idea that they were like, you know what, that'd be a really good idea. Oh man, I don't have time to put it in. I mean, for me, there's a, there, were, there were a bunch of people that could have made it in. I would say offhand, one, one, one would be, um, oh man, I'm forgetting his name. The, uh, and his name will come to me and I'll blurt it out later on. But, but the gentleman that, that, that took the, the spirituals and, and, and put them on paper. He, 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 made, he designed them for the concert stage. Very hmm. fascinating guy who, uh, who I, at one point studied with uh, Anton Dvorak. Really interesting story there. Never made it in the book, but uh, I was wondering if y'all had some, any element that you felt like it could make it, almost made it, but it didn't seem like it. Oh yeah, for me, I'm, I wasn't sure if you're directing it to me or Rachel, but I have so many that didn't make it in the book. I At one point I kept a little file called Secret Extras. And that was just everything that my editor made me take out of the book that she was right, but I, I, you know, I couldn't quite throw them out. So I have the secret extras file on my computer and maybe, you know, time by you're really making me think maybe for my next project, that is a good place to go digging. So <laughs> was, was there a, was there a theme? Was there something that made those things have to go according to your editor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> My editor was so, Kate Medina at Random House, she was so interested in streamlining the book mm -hmm. in a way that really strengthened and sharpened it. But there was all that I digressed a lot, you know, and digre I love digressions. And, and I think in, it depends on the book, whether digressions can really work. You know, I wonder if it's the same in poetry, how much license you feel you have to digress. But in novels, some of the best writing, in my opinion, is are in digressions, and yet it does take you away from the story. So I think it's about finding that balance. Well, the great thing about poetry is is that um, it's so it's such. A, I mean, there's so many different forms and so many ways to come into it. It's 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 uh, it's very elastic, you know. And it's it'll, there's so many so many different ways to come at it, and, and that that it's uh, it's just you know very vibrant and it can hold almost any any package you can provide mm. inside poetry, and that, and that and that's a beautiful thing. This like poetry is one thing you read, and you do not there there is no actual expectation at the end. In other words. Let me put it like like that there, there is no like in there is no narrative necessarily that has to come together. It's more about it can it can be just about conveying an emotion, period, you know what I'm saying, through however that happens. And so that affords a lot of latitude in a lot of different ways and a, and a lot of you know really interesting expression. Not yeah. not to not to diss novels, but <laughs> Novels do tend to sort of tend to organize themselves around more conventional structures, but it's also true that, of course, they can do anything, too. And one thing I really like about teaching fiction writing is being able to sort of see over the years, oh, look at all these people writing all this fiction all these different ways and how to help mm -hmm. students figure out what it is they want to do and how to get there. I feel like I've become much more open in terms of what I think a story is or what I think a novel is, too. Um, 
And Allison, I was going to say, I had this reverse experience about um, that you had in terms of working with your editor. I had made a great effort to streamline the draft of this novel that I eventually um, sent to my agent. And so I, I took out a lot of digressions and I took out a lot of background. And then after she sold the book, the editor had a couple of really great suggestions. And one of the things she said was, I think you don't know nearly enough about this character's background or family to understand the mm -hmm. context of where she's coming from. And I was like, oh, I have this computer file that's completely full of all these things about her family. I will just put them right back in. And then I got some new ones too, but mostly it was sort of this great moment of, he just asked me to do a lot of work that it's already done, actually, kind of magically. Um, and I was really happy that somebody wanted to publish the book who did want the digressions and the background mm -hmm. and the sort of richness that that, that that gave rather than the sense like, no, we must, we must follow this thread. I love that story also because it's such a, it, it shows so beautifully how collaborative a creative relationship can be with an, an author and an editor and how when you get someone who really understands the project, I mean, it can be such a nurturing relationship. Tayemba, do, do you have an editor or um, other poets in your life who sort of serve that purpose for you? Yeah, I have a crew. I have a crew. <laughs> I, you know, communicate with and send things to and whatnot. And uh, I would say that they, you know, they gave me great feedback. I, I would say that I also had a very, very, very unique publisher, and that is Wave Books. Wave Books, um, this, this book here, okay, is more or less eight by 12, okay? Mm. Uh, 200, I got I think what was it 300 pages and there are pages that literally you can are perforated and you can tear them out oh, of the that. book they're folded and um, there's illustrations that were put in at the last minute they're bibliophiles and they really really mm. love the art of the book so wave publishing I was very very lucky to have had my first book published by them and 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 then, they, and really, a lot of the the editing that came in was uh, was the major editing was they had an excruciatingly um, uh, uh, attention to detail type editor that that was all on all on the all on the dates and the years mm -hmm. and and, the, and those type of things, and he was just extremely nitpicky which I really needed. <laughs> I really needed. I, and I, I was hats off to you for going through about 200 years of, of dates, you know, so, yeah. Hi. Great Hello. discussion, guys. Good to see you. Um, I have, there's no questions from the audience, which is, tells me that they are all focused on you. Um, but I have a couple book related questions as we round out our hour, which I really don't want to do, but it's sort of a necessary, necessary part of right America is to come to an end at some point. But I do want to ask each of you, if you know an emerging author that you think we should know about. Jess, I think I saw you go get a book earlier. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, this is Khalees Stewart. She's, she's out of Chicago. This is the name of this book is Small Altars, Small Altars, and it's off of uh, Brownsville Books. And, you know, I, what I'm really struck with is like the, the rawness and the, and the honesty and the, and the, also the, I, I mean, can you still hear me? Yeah. And also the the real the, the the great imagery that's in the in the poems. So very raw, very honest, very human, um, and very original. Yeah, great. Thank you. You you notice I'm writing, so I just thank you for <laughs> sharing that. Um, I was trying to decide between um, a couple of books. Uh, the the one that I'm really thinking of is it's it's the writer's second book so not but that's definitely still emerging the writer is sarah sarah novich 
N O V I C, and she has a book that was out this year called True Biz, which is about a cast of characters around a school for the deaf in Ohio. And um, one of the things the book does is it has these uh, sort of intermittent little sections that are about American Sign Language and the grammar of it and um, with pictures, illustrations to sort of help you understand certain things. Um, and it's a great story and it opened up a world to me that I didn't know that much about. Um, and it had all these different points of view. And I think she's a really great book to read and a really good writer to watch. And from Philadelphia, okay. like me. And I would Allison. recommend, um, there's a, I don't know if she's emerging, I think she's emerged, but she's not, she deserves to be more widely known. Her name is Danielle Evans, who's a short story writer. And she wrote a collection called Before You Suffocate Your Own Fool Self. And her most recent collection is The Office of Historical Corrections. And she writes oh, about that race book. and gender. And um, she explores sort of the traumas of the American history and our past, our, you know, the past of our country, but does it in this really beautiful way through these moving characters and through this kind of spiny, sharp humor. Um, I think humor is really underused in literary fiction, and she's an example of just how this crackling wit that keeps you turning the pages. I really admire her. Well, thank you all. Um, what are you all reading right now? The bookstore owner wants to know. <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to hold up Roger Reeves right quick. Also, uh, best, best barbarian. This is a very intense piece of work. You know, Roger Reeves, well done. Really, really good work. All right, I'll, I'll hold up too. I'm reading um, the new memoir by Ada Calhoun, also a poet, about um, about her father, Peter Sheldahl, the art critic, trying to write a biography of Frank O'Hara. So lots of different ways of being a writer, um, trying to think about their relationship to the past. And I really, I really love it. And I was, um, I was at a new independent bookstore for me uh, last week and the bookstore um, merchant recommended this book that I'm really enjoying called A Psalm for the Wild Built. You're nodding, Alice. This is a new book of us. Uh, it's science fiction, but it's sort of short, philosophical, quirky, a uh, story about so a planet with a monk and a robot and the in the relationship that develops between them by Becky Chambers, which is which I'm just mm -hmm. sitting through. So two very different kinds of books. Allison. And I'll recommend The Long Answer by Anna Hoagland, which is a debut novel that just came out last week. It's autofiction, and it's a narrator who sort of collects and listens to the stories of women who are pregnant and who are su suffering complications with pregnancy. Some are thinking about abortion, some are suffering miscarriages, some are thinking excitedly about the children that they will have. And it's these really beautiful sort of interconnected stories that center the experience of women in a, in a great diversity of uh, feelings and ambitions related to pregnancy. And I think it's such a beautiful and important book, especially now after the Roe ruling. I'd like to thank the three of you. It's been a very rich evening. Um, I'm going to have to sign off now. But I'd like to thank Rachel, Allison, and Taimba, or Jess, for participating in Write America this evening. And to everyone who tuned in tonight, and thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series. We look forward to it each and every Monday night. Tonight's episode is the perfect example of the purpose and mission of Write America. We will take a break next Monday in, observant, in observance of Independence Day, and we hope to see each of you at our next episode, Monday, July 11th at 7, as we welcome Vanessa QT, um, Elizabeth Nunez, and Imani Perry. Please remember to check out Bird's Books Write America page where you can sign up for upcoming episodes and maybe purchase a book or two. 
Thank you for joining us tonight. Good evening.